thing got an alfalfa thing going on with the hair right here. You know, I I, I try to fix it, but that's all right. Y'all know it's mother love. How you doing today, babies? Life is going pretty crazy around here and every place else. Uh, my executive producer was saying something about the, the planet. What was you telling me about the planet? Pluto is behind the sun and it's wreaking havoc and running them up? Pluto's an Aquarius. Okay, we, a little more than that. Pluto is in Aquarius. Pluto's in Aquarius right now. We uh -huh. have a lot of celestial energy going on right now. Pretty much the, the planet Pluto is behind the sun and the energy from Pluto uh, has a powerful uh, array of energy that blasts, that is blasting the sun from behind it, which is sending radioactive uh, energy towards the, towards the earth. So because of the, that's why we're having a lot of um, interruptions. interruptions as far as all of our telecommunications uh, and, and our weather where, you know, the, the, the weather is getting amplified and people are getting sick. So if any illness you have, stay inside. They're getting amplified now. The more you're amongst other people, you may be grabbing other things. So just be careful out there, people. And people really need to understand the power of the energy that the universe puts out there for us to tap into. And when we have all this negative energy going on around us, even in us, we have to understand it, try to un work to understand it and work to understand that this is a real deal, that the energy in the universe is so powerful. You know, keep, people keep saying, you know what? Well, I don't know why this happened to me. I don't know why I'm having such bad luck. I don't know what's going on. A lot of that got to do with karma, though. Don't you think so? Yeah. Um, Got a lot to do with karma, and a lot of karma is coming back on a lot of people that don't understand what's happening to them. I don't know what's wrong, but you got to get into yourself. You got to start tuning into yourself and understanding what are your stress factors so that when this, this kind of energy is coming around, you can be at least knowledgeable and even a little more prepared is what I'm saying. You know, and so and we got to think about all of that. And and we were talking, and we always say this, we talk about this, about how the universe will correct herself. And I believe that she is in the mode of correcting herself. You think about all the horrible things that are going on. I mean, people are killing up their entire families. One guy just the other day outside of Chicago killed everybody. He killed eight people and then killed himself. And they said most of the people that he murdered were his own relatives. So if that's not, if this ain't, if that ain't biblical, am, am I, am I tripping? Am I like off key? Am I out of the space that this is like biblical, that this is something that uh, Nostradamus and uh, Daniel predicted in, in the Bible, that this, these things were going to happen. Uh, you know, you see fathers raising up against fathers. What about dude down there that was the pillar of the community, they had a family name. I think it's the Murdoch, Murdoch, Murdoch Martar family, where the father had two sons and a devoted wife. And he decided and he's a big time attorney. So, see, Murdoch, uh, Murdoch, yeah, him. Okay, oh, bummer. Uh, we'll get him back when he comes in. Uh, the Murdoch, 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 mm -hmm. right. He, he was an attorney down there in South Carolina. Big time. I mean, their name is all over everything. You know, this is a legacy. And for whatever reason, he got, went to crazy town, murdered his wife and his son. So the other son, so the other son could get his inheritance. He had something like a, 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 a multi-million dollar life insurance policy on, on his wife and his son and killed his I mean, just did not even seem to care about the legacy that they built. And then it came crumbling, crashing down. It was these people's lives, the family members, her family, his family, his son, all of these people are going to, are adversely affected. And people are not really understanding about the energy. I mean, rem I remember not even 10 years ago. You never heard us talking about, oh, not openly. You never heard anybody talking open, openly about the mental health issue in this country and around the world. And for some asinine reason, people who are, and these are the powers that be, that a lot of them are voted into office. We elect them, you know, we appoint them, we choose them. And then we see that it's just going to be 
a hot mess, a double hot mess, like a nuclear hot mess, because everybody wants to be the chief and there are no Indians. And then the chief, the, the, everybody wants to be a follower. I'm going to use a different, a different analogy. Everybody wants to be the leader with no leadership skills. And they want everybody to follow behind them simply because they say, I'm the leader. I run the church. I run the business. I run this home. This is what I do. And this is my, this is what I am supposed to do. And oftentimes that's just some stuff you'd have made up just to keep control over other people. And that's what people want. They want control. I, I, and I, listen, I am one of those people. And then I, I should say, no, most of the time I do want to have control. So I know what that feels like. I'm not so in control that I can't say, okay, you know, you can't say, well, you know, mother love, what about this, that, and the third? And I go, oh, oh, I never thought about it that way. I never looked at that. And we don't, and we close our minds up, just shut them up. I don't want to hear anything you have to say. I don't want to listen to anything you have to say. They're like petulant children. I can't even say teenagers because you, and when your kids get like that and they start, See, this is another thing. The parental, the parental roles have been broken down to near ashes. You know, the the government was saying uh, to women who were having babies out of wedlock, and you know, the babies out of wedlock. And I, I had, I wasn't, I wasn't legally married to my baby daddy, but we we lived as as a, as a, as married people. And I remember I was, you know, I was in them one of them little tizzies. I'm like, you know what, I'm about sick of him. And so I called our family attorney, who they keep on retaining, and I called him up and I said, okay, now you know me and him, we've been together for a long time. He's like, what do you mean well, you've been together for a long time? How long y'all been married? I was like, see, he. this is our family attorney who had known us since we were like knee high to a grasshopper. And he said, what do we do? I thought you guys were married. I said, no, not legally. He said, well, in the state of Ohio, when a couple presents themselves as married, they carry on as if they're married, they're cohabitating, they're even having children. You know, you have we had a joint bank account and all of that. And he said, you present yourself as a married couple. And if you decide that you want to leave this man, you'll have to get a divorce. I'm like, what? What do you mean? And I didn't, I that was see, you learn something all the time, every day. And I said, oh. And he said, you know, this this could this could not bode well for you, my dear. And I'm like, oh, he could get whatever he wanted to get. And he was like, well, that ain't going to happen. You know, that just wasn't going to happen. And that's how I did get a marriage proposal, because I told him, I said, you know, I, this is this going on too long. And, and the attorney said that if we wanted to split up, we'd have to get a divorce. He was like, oh, that's not that's not that's out of the question. Like we were married. It was too funny. And then when we did get married, when we sent out the wedding invitations, I honestly did not realize that most of our friends and family looked at us as a married couple. That was like, oh, oh, okay. And so, and the energy behind when that happened, I mean, because you you never know when it's coming, you know, you never know when it's coming and you should expect it. You don't know when, you don't know where, but you will know the why. You will understand the why because you'll start thinking back and you know rewinding that life tape, and you go, "Oh, yeah, I did some kind, some kind of jacked up uh, stuff to, you know, sissy girl, and uh, that wasn't right, you know." And then I wonder, well, what happened to so and so and such and such? You got to think about it. And then when you look back, and I, I one of the things I ask my guests when they come on is at, at the end of the conversation, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want your legacy to be? And you got to think about that because legacy, yay or nay, is what you leave behind, are the footprints that you leave behind. And we have a conscious choice as human beings. We have a conscious choice to be able to, where well, we're supposed to be able to reason and work through it logically and realistically. And so many of us live in a bubble and, oh, everything's going to be all right. I don't need to get involved. Somebody else will take care of it. Oh, that's not my issue. That's not my problem. And my question is, so... Whose problem is it? If you're not taking responsibility and you talk to 10 other people and they're not taking responsibility and you see that your, your family is crumbling, your church is falling apart, your neighborhood is in disarray, who's to blame for that? 
Who's going to take responsibility for that? We got enough blame for everything to go around. I blame my husband for everything. My son, 90% of the men in my life, I blame them for everything. They had, they messed up global warming. They, you know, did a whole bunch of stuff. And they just kind of, yeah, they, yeah. I hear, I hear what y'all saying. I can feel what you're saying right here on the camera. And, and because they always say all the problems that happen, that happen to us are because of women. We come in and have to clean up a lot of y'all uh, dookie that y'all leave all over the furniture in the house and in, in, in the atmosphere and in, in life, period. And I'm telling you, my sister, girlfriends, my queens, my sorors, the divine nine, and all the women that I know and don't know. You know who's going to clean this up. This is what we do. And I mean, you know, this is what we do. We clean up the mess. When you think, my, my grandmother and my mother, they used to say this all the time. And I really didn't understand what it meant, you know, because back in the day, they had a phrase for everything. They said, a man will work from sun to sun. A woman's work is never done. And it's never done. You know, people think when, you know, you have kids and, you know, you trying to raise them right, like you think they should be raised. And sometimes the thinking that you thinking is right to raise your children be all jacked up because you can't teach what you don't know. If you've never got compassion and, and, and been passionate about something, you will not understand what those words mean. You won't understand what compassion means. You won't understand the, the powerful uh, emotion of empathy, of sympathy. That means putting them, putting yourself in their shoes. I tell people this all the time, you know, and I go out and people, you know, and one of the things I do is I've always been, I've always given advice to people about their love life. You know, for some reason they thought I was the bomb. Okay. Yeah. Me and my husband, we've been together. We could write like 11 team books. I told him just write, write your book after I leave the planet, you know, cause I know he probably won't write a book, but he, cause he know he knows where the bodies are buried. And so, um, you want to raise your kids like you think is right. Raise them in the church or you don't raise them in the church. You know, you do raise them in the church and they grow up and they become rebellious. You know, and then sometimes when they get rebellious, you know, they'll come back because they'll they'll understand that mom and dad, grandma, great grandma and the, and the elders in the community in the village, they really knew what they were talking about. When I was 18, I, well, no, when I was growing up, I, yeah, I was about 18, 17 or 18. And I thought my mother, God rest her blessed soul, who was a widow at 30 years old with six children, only seven years separated the oldest from the youngest. Our father dropped dead. I told you he dropped dead telling a joke. And then I wanted to go into comedy. Nonetheless, uh, he dropped dead and she was there with six little kids and a widow. And she never remarried. And she, our father had said, he was an atheist. And uh I said, wait, well, well, if you you don't believe in God, why you make us why you make us go to Sunday school and to church? And he said, just in case, just in case. You know, they had great phrases. And when I got old enough to understand, I thought my mother was, like I said, I thought she was like the stupidest, dumbest person on the planet. How could she possibly even understand what it's like to uh what it's like to uh oh excuse me. Oh, I got a water gun. Okay, it, it went back. <laughs> I had a little back force. Uh, she was, what was I telling y'all? She was, she was saying, I thought she was just dumb. She didn't know anything about love. How would you know understand about love? You got six kids. What? That didn't make any sense. Time I turned 18, and I was away in college, and I, all of the things that she had taught me that were in me, that I was rebellious against, and I was like, I'm not doing that. And I couldn't. I, I, my biggest thing was my mouth and I couldn't tell time real well. I mean, I mean, I knew what the time was, but you know, when you're a teenager and they say you got a curfew, you know, you better be back by 1130. I'm like, my, the party don't start at 1130 and they invite, I'm the party coming with them. You know, you got to understand well, you ain't going to have no friends then. And so when I, like I said, when I became uh, turned 18 years old and like when I turned 18 and I was in college, I, I was in I was in college and 
you know, like the kids were, that were, we were pretty much all the same age. And I was younger than most of them because I didn't turn, actually turn 18 until December. And we went to school starting in August. Well, you know, I came in and did my, my chick thing. And, you know, I'm the life of the party and we're having fun. The fellas love me. The girls love me. The RAs, not so much. They said I was a menace to campus life. Uh, well, that's what the ombudsman said. That's a whole nother story. That's a whole nother story. Oh my goodness, wait a minute. Wait, okay. Hi, Mother Love. Saw you were live, so sad. Hi, that's one of my producers from Forgive and Forget Reason, Slash Low Nicholson. And got our baby look like she said, girl child. She is beautiful. Thank you for listening to. Oh, I'm so glad that you are you got connected to me. I talk about y'all all the time and how great you guys were. It is that is just so wonderful. So anyway, I'm I've turned into like the uh they call, start that's why they start calling me sister love. Oh, sister love, can you do so and so and such and such? Oh, can you, you know, they which the fellas would show me stuff where they where they grow in pieces parts. Where they grow pieces, parts, and things are growing on their on they, uh, unmentionables under their skivvies and carrying on. I'm like, oh, yeah, we got to take you to the free clinic. You know, call the VD. That's what they used to call them, VDs. Now they're called STDs, venereal diseases. Then there were so many of them, I guess, that were coming up, chlamydia and, and, and all the other stuff. That's icky. But still, I was so happy to know that I was instilling the wisdom that my mother and the women, the elder women in our family had instilled in me to take with me to be able to share with other people. And they called me, they started calling me sister love. I just love it. Okay, yeah, he was drunk and we was having fun. He was like, you know, how there are different kinds of drunks, right? There's, uh, the, I love everybody. I love all of you. I love everybody. Then you got your means. Oh yeah, now you gonna bring your trifling behind up here acting like you somebody. You ain't no Nobody you ain't never gonna be nobody. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know this drunk. And then you get the passive drunk. The, the ones that crack, I, they really don't crack me up because it's really kind of sad. The crying drunk. <laughs> and they start telling you all their business. And sometimes you don't even want to hear that. <laughs> and they, I just would hold them, and, you know. I wouldn't be condescending to them, but I would tell them what the truth was according to what I knew. And for the most part, you know, they thought I was like the relationship sage, even in college. And uh, the fellas used to say, uh, and this was from all the fraternities, everyone on Phi Beta Kappa. I mean, uh, beta, what is it? Sigma, Sigma Phi, what is, why can't I, uh, Beta Sig, what, why can't I call it? Okay, but y'all know who y'all are in the divine night. My brain is on, is in poop town. And so I became that person. I was that person. I didn't become that person. I was that person. And they reinforced that in me to be, to, and I learned compassion. I saw compassion. I saw co how compassionate uh, our mother was. We were six kids and a widow woman living in a four bedroom, one bathroom project. And people would come over to our house and they would walk in and they would say, if people did, if people did, you, you can't tell nobody you living in the projects with all this stuff. Okay, yeah, my my mother was a great interior decorator, and it didn't look like you walked into the projects. And she said, just because you're poor, don't mean you have to be trifling. Just because you don't have a lot of means does not give you carte blanche to be nasty. She used to tell us, I better be able to come in here and throw my food on the floor and eat it off the floor, and I bet it better not have any crunch in it. And it didn't. Because, you know, you ain't no telling what would have happened. <laughs> you ain't no telling what would happen. And so we were able to see that. My mother was that person in our family and in our community. She was a registered nurse. She did. You know how some people change jobs? Our mother changed professions. And she went from, she used to be a, 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 a male sort of with the post office. And then she said that, you know, I got all these kids and they keep, they keep doing crazy stuff. My One of my brothers, he, he could eat anything, drink anything. He had taken a whole bottle. That's why they got on the, on the if you ever want to know why they put that on the, on the medicines, keep out of the reach of children. Because children, when we were growing up, we were just, told, you don't touch that. It wasn't about something on the label. Well, one time, my youngest brother, he must have been about four or five years old. And you talking about a mischievous imp. This kid was, oh, my God, I couldn't stand him. Because he it was my sister, me, my brother, and then him. 
He's the fourth one and he was bigger than all of us. He was he was a big baby and he learned to walk fast. And I would be sitting on the floor like I'm getting ready to fly an airplane. And he would come like I was a bowling pin and just run into me, just bowl me over. He thought that was the funniest thing like ever. And I'm like, that ain't funny. Well, he could eat anything. One day he took decided to eat half a bottle of adult bear aspirin. And they had to take him to the emergency room and get his stomach pumped. And, you know, my mother knew what to do to make sure his life was safe. And she had, let me tell you, you need a child to throw up. You got to give him, it's a concoction. I know you could Google it, but it'd be some kind of mustard stuff. And it, 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 we didn't, I don't even think Serpent Ipecac was out. It might've been, but we didn't have it. They made this mustard stuff and made us drink it. And you just puked everywhere. And then you just had to clean up your puke. Well, he had ate a whole half a bottle of bear ass. And he went into some sort of a, I don't know if it was a seizure we, or whatever it was. He just didn't look right. And he was really, really, really fair skinned. He, I thought he was white. I'm just going to keep it real. I thought he was white. I was so proud I had a white brother. I went and told everybody to nursery school, my mama bought home us a white brother. He got big red curls in his hand. He got blue eyes and long red eyelashes. Okay, well, that didn't last till by the time he got to be three or four. But I was I was cool with it. And they pumped his stomach and he everything was fine. He came home and went and did some other crazy stuff that he would do. And a little boy about his same age that lived behind us. We lived up on the third floor and we could look out the kitchen window and see another row of houses because we lived in an apartment building. And there was a row of houses that you could see and a playground separated us. And we saw, look, looking out the door, we saw, uh, I'm not going to call her name, but we just going to say we saw Miss Mama coming, running out the door with her baby in her arms. And she was screaming, help, 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 help. And my mother couldn't get down the th down the, to the, uh, down to her, over there to her quick enough. Well, finally, they got the child to the, uh, got him to the emergency room. And unfortunately, his heart had stopped. And he was getting no oxygen. I, I don't remember all the verbiage, but his heart had stopped. And they said he was, that he wasn't getting oxygen to his brain. And he eventually made his transition at five, four or five years old from a half a bottle of baby aspirin. Baby aspirin. So, you know, God is God all by himself. And you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, it, and, and back then, you know, when a, when a child passed away, uh, they would, I mean, it was just devastating to the whole community. And then when our leaders start passing away or, and, or moving away and, or passing away, it left a big void. And so my mother, for her, she and a group of her friends, they, they decided to pick up the gauntlet and walk through it. And she became like the like the neighborhood, uh, the neighborhood nurse. Something happened. Somebody drank something, ate something, spilled something on them. Got into some, you know, some kind of mechanical trouble or whatever it was. They called my mom because we six of us. Somebody was going to do something wild and undisciplined, and we knew that. We knew it was going to be wild and undisciplined because that's who we were. And I, I, when I was a little kid. I don't, I kind of sort of remember this. And you know, when people got a memory of you, you know, the story changes throughout the years. But mine was basically the same. My mother said when I was about three or four years old, and we're living up on the third floor, the same apartment building. And they had the window boxes. I don't know. Some of you might not know what a window box is with the flowers. Google it. Uh, Bing it. Whatever it is that y'all do on the internet. And they, she had, a, she loved geraniums and they were really pretty, but they tasted really fuzzy. And I was in the window eating the geraniums and the fuzz was all over my lips and my lips had turned red. My tongue was all red. And I turned around and I, I turned around my lips. And she looked at me and she like, were you eating the geraniums? I didn't know what a geranium was. It was a flower. I was eating a geranium. She gave me the mustard stuff, so I threw up, and you know, the rest they say is history. We were always getting into some kind of something, and so realizing that this is who my mother was, and she was compassionate with us for the most part. She said I was her problem child, so I got the brunt of her wrath. Okay, I got the brunt of her wrath, and didn't realize it until I was an adult. Had a child, was married. And I happened to ask my mother, you know, well, what was the deal? Why, how come you didn't like me? 
She said, what are you talking about? I said, you were just always on me for everything. I couldn't get in the house, couldn't get home on time. You started putting the wagon up. You wouldn't give me a door key. Everybody had a week to wash dishes. And if the kitchen wasn't clean, you got another week. I ended up washing dishes for seven and a half years until I left to go to college. And I said, I ain't going to wash another dish. It did give me a phobia, though. I would go over to people's houses. And if there are dirty dishes in the sink, I will wash them. And I don't even have to know y'all could just be over your house. My sister and them, they, they knew what it was. And I found out I had to get the jig. The jig was up when I found that. I said, girl, you know, she coming over. Don't wash your dishes. You know, she like washing dishes. I did not like washing dishes. I didn't like a nasty kitchen. And I don't think, and it's just me. I, and a lot of these young people are not concerned about how neat and clean their homes are, but I am. I'm, I've always been concerned. And when we were growing up, the big thing in our house was nobody could put or would put the top back on the toothpaste. I think we're the reason why the toothpaste companies created that little flip top on the toothpaste so we just go back on because we would lose the, somebody would lose the top to the toothpaste and toothpaste would be all over and they would think they would, you know, we used to eat toothpaste, but they say, you can't eat, you're not supposed to eat. Did you know you're not supposed to eat toothpaste? Not supposed to swallow? One day when you get a minute, look at the ingredients on your toothpaste. Just, just, just read them. They're there for you. And so when I became that person for the kids and for the, my classmates in college and them calling me Sister Love, and I was there. I mean, I was there. If I could, when I could help you, I would. Now, with, with the crazy stuff, I'm not, I'm not getting ready to deal with that. I'm not getting all in your personal business. I, I got enough issues on my own. You got to handle that. And come to find out, a lot of these kids had never been away from home. I, we got we went to camp for two weeks every summer. We went for two weeks to Illyria, and that family in Illyria came to our house for two weeks. So it were 12 kids in one house at, put for two weeks in, in, in Illyria on the farm and 12 kids in our house in, the, in, that, in that project room. And we made it work. We made it work. And it was, a, it was a good lesson for us to learn, for all of us. There were many lessons. And it seems like now people want to teach because you can't, you, you got to teach what you know. And when you don't know it and you know you need to teach it, go learn it. Go learn it. It's all right as an adult, as a parent, as a teacher, as a leader. If somebody, if a kid asks you a question, and you, it's all right to say, you know, I don't know that. Let's go find out together. Let's go find out what that is. Hey, E Groove, AK Emily, what's up with you, baby? Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate y'all watching what we're doing and carrying on and listening to me. Listen, I, and I'm giving out some good information because this is applicable throughout life. You know, uh, humanity doesn't change, ugly can change, hatefulness can change. What did Dr. King say? The only way to put out the darkness is with the light. The only way to get out of hate is with love. And we got to first start loving and believing and trusting and knowing that we are lovable. And a lot of these kids, like I said, had never been away from home. They didn't know how to act. The chicks was running buck wild. And the fellas was just gone. Every chick they saw who panties was on fire, they thought they was the fire extinguisher. Thought they were the fire marshal. One of our friends even called, I'm the fire marshal. I could put their pants. I'm like, boy, shut up. You don't know. You stop talking. And then they like for me to go off on people because everybody was like, Oh, I don't want to say anything. And, you know, oh, he's this way and he's that way. And a few of the ladies had come from abusive relationships. And I knew what that looked like because we saw a lot of abuse in our neighborhoods. Um, you, you would see, you know, one of the mothers that lived a few worlds away from us. And she was like this many big, about this many tall, a tiny lady. Could buy her clothes out the children's department. And she had this big, fat, mean ugly grill when i say ugly he his his spirit was ugly and he was one of them uh, he was i didn't i didn't bring i didn't forgot to take the violent drunk when they want to get drunk and they want to knock stuff around tear up your house you know knock you around and and one time i i don't know what happened but he kicked her out of her house now he was visiting he wasn't her husband he was like her man that was her man he kicked her out of her house in the wintertime, snow almost knee deep, threw her out the back of the back door in the snow. 
in her in her lingerie, in her what they call it, negligee. You could see everything. He drunk and he got that. Go on over there, run away, run away. Well, she ran to my mother, and you know they my mother would come and get me up because she said, "Well, you the one that can have you can help me." deal with this and you know i would go be the one to go get the towels and you know find some clean clothes for her to wear draw her a bath get her clean you know get her washed so, and get her warm get them you know put on some uh, pot of coffee whatever was was needed at the time and she was telling my mother this story okay and i know i was supposed to be a, i don't know why i be whispering when i say this gotta stop <laughs> like they didn't hear me so i was sitting on the steps and I, she couldn't see me sitting on the steps and I think she heard me and I could hear her talking, talking this woman down, telling her what she need, you know, that she need to call the police. She need to get a restraining order on him. And, you know, back in the day, this is like in the, in the early sixties, the police didn't really respond to our neighborhood in a timely manner. So we had to learn how to police ourselves and our communities, you know, and, and the police, to my recollection, never did come for her. So that she spent the night and the next day, uh, my because one of her daughters and I were friends. So her, her daughter saw everything and we was in class in school. She was telling me what was happening. And I said, oh, my mama said, you know, um, if you, when you go home for lunch, you know, get a bag and put some of your mother's things in her clothes, some shoes, a coat, you know, some things like that. You know, her, some personal items or toothbrush. And she did. So she... Bless her heart. Girl, you know, I know I, uh, oh, I just seeing, I can see her face right now. She brought the bag. I take it home and it was like a pass off. She went and got the stuff. She brings it to school to me. I come home. I give it to my mother. They got her straight. My mother took her down to the police department and I would, I, no, I'm going to, my mother was a very convincing woman. Yeah, she could sell an Eskimo snow. I'm telling you, she could drown a, a drop of water, kill a rock. This is the kind of personality she had. Well, when they came out, she had a restraining order against her. Against, yeah, against him. So then when he found out he had a restraining order, get oh, you know, they went to the whole, y'all heifers is tearing up the neighborhood. You one who can't, can't, a colored man can't do nothing. My mother looked him square in the face and said, a man does not hit a woman. You just a scared, ugly little boy. Oh, I was, I just knew it was going to be some fisticuffs. His face went for because sometimes, but oftentimes, bullies need to be checked. And when bullies are checked, most of the time they'll stop bullying if they know that you they cannot get a rise out of you anymore. And that's what they prey on. They prey on people who are timid. They play on prey on people who are quiet. You know, like it, it, it's it, it's almost it's almost like you know uh, preying on preying on a. Uh, Praying on a child that that you see that an adult sees in the parking lot or sees on the playground, not playing with the kids and come over. Hi, can I buy you some candy? And you might not never see that child again. And, you know, and we were told not to talk to strangers. Now, that was way long time ago. You don't talk to strangers and you don't never, ever walk up to no man or don't let no man walk up to you. And, uh, and she told us this. You, the only man that got any kind of uh, car blunts to kick to whoop you is your daddy and where's your daddy well mom well mama daddy did with the uh-uh you ain't gonna did not tolerate it i couldn't even imagine and, and i've been on the planet for a minute i couldn't even imagine a guy actually physically hitting me and it was gonna be two things he gonna hit me and one of us is coming up dead it was just like that. We were taught to defend ourselves. We were uh, one of my mother's friends was a letter carrier, and he had all kind of little tricks he would teach the girls and my brothers. You know how to defend yourself. You know, and they always told us always go in a group. They, we were taught cross the street with a group of people, and that's what we did. And now you got all these. Um, well, we I was a latchkey kid, but actually I was not a latchkey kid because to be a latchkey kid, you would have to have a key, right? I never had a key to our house, never. And my mother said, you ain't getting no key. Well, I can't get a key, everybody else got a key. Cause I need to know when your behind is walking through the door. I want to see that hour, the minute, the second. I want to see when you coming in. So that way I can know what the punishment going to be for you breaking curfew. I'm like, well, wouldn't it make more sense if you just didn't give me a curfew? Okay. I know what y'all saying. 
and my people and my relatives. I know y'all be I know y'all be watching me. I see y'all up on Facebook. Y'all know what the deal is. And let me tell you, they only talk to me on Facebook. They don't pick up the phone and call me. That's what the kids do. They don't call you anymore. And so I was like, mm, that wasn't the right thing to say. And she went clean off on me. My friends used to say, uh, because my mother was backhanded. Got you got fingers, got this part of her hand, I think, swole up. And they said, oh, my God, what? I'm talking to the side of my mouth. See, I didn't know this was a thing that they did. But that mean, when you're talking to the side of your mouth, that means you're lying. No, I'm talking to the side of my mouth because I got smacked in the other part of my mouth. And so they said, girl, what happened to you? I said, I said something to my mama that I shouldn't have said. Was, girl, are you crazy? You know your mama crazy. <laughs> and our thing was, our classmates, when we were not around our parents, we called our parents by their first names. So we knew, that's how we found out who everybody's parents in the neighborhood was by, by their first name. Because you weren't allowed to address an adult by their first name. Period. I don't care if she was married, it's miss. She's married, it's missus. It's a boy, he's master. It's a man, he's mister. It, yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. You know, stay in a child's place. And I would I would always have this comment, and I don't know how they heard I would say, I am in a child's place. I ain't moved. I ain't over there at the big table with the adults. And my mother would say, you know, I can hear you thinking. You know, they could, they could whoop stuff out, out like that on you. And it, it really came in handy as, as I was, you know, uh, I would call it a, a it was a God-given call. And kind of in a way, it was a ministry because some of them wanted me to pray with them. And I had never actually prayed with people um, outside of the church. You know, we said our grace at every meal, you know, and we said, God bless you when you sneeze. Um, but to, you know, just to minister and say, well, will you pray with me? Will you come and go to church with me? And that was a cool thing when I was growing up too, because we grew up Baptist. And when we got about, I guess maybe about 13 or 14, okay, you didn't have a choice whether you're going to get up and go to Sunday school. And I think once I hit teenagers, I should make the decision about whether I'm going to go to church. And can I make the decision about, uh, and I didn't, I thought the only faith, the only religion was Baptist. And then one of my friends, they moved in and they were Jehovah's Witnesses. And I just liked the way it sounded. That's Jehovah's Witnesses. And I saw in the Bible, Jehovah. And, you know, God got all kind of names. Yahweh, Master, Prince of Peace. Y'all know all the names. And I was like, okay. And she asked me to go to go to the hall. They didn't call it church. They called it to go to the kingdom hall. And I said, oh, yeah to the kingdom hall okay and i sat there and i i didn't go just once i went like two or three times so i could absorb the culture and my mother was starting to get a little nervous and she was like so you know you keep and we had to go to church i could go with her either before church or after church whenever it was but i still had to go to our church and uh she asked me to go to the kingdom hall with her and i said okay and she was a very quiet uh, all her whole family they were very quiet I didn't look at them as 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 timid because when she and I were out there playing jacks or kickball or four corners or whatever we were playing softball, she was like right in the game with us, even though we couldn't wear shorts and slacks and stuff. She was right there with us. I go to the Kingdom Hall, and I was like this close to you know saying I I, I could do this, you know. And then they, you know the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses they come to your house on Saturday and 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 want to talk to you and give you the Watchtower and the Awake. And I would always you know take them because it's reading and I'm learning. And then I learned that Jehovah's Witnesses don't celebrate. They don't celebrate your birthday. They don't celebrate your nothing. They don't celebrate Christmas, New Year. They don't celebrate any holiday. Now, coming from the land of celebratory events, because that's who we were. I mean, my mother set it out for every holiday from, from New Year's Eve to Easter. And, and, and listen, we celebrated everything. We celebrated Arbor Day. We celebrated Hanukkah. We celebrated. And then when we got uh, Kwanzaa, we celebrated that. We celebrate everything. Like she would tell us, celebrate every day that has a Y in it. And every day has a Y in it. And that's why it's called the present. This is a gift. You're to open it up with the wonderment, with the amazement of what the day's possibilities could bring, what you can bring to the table, what you will learn, what you can leave on the table for others to feast off of. And we, we have gotten so far away from that. And that's why I know, I, I know how important it is for us to stay connected, for us to be able to communicate. We're not going to always get along. Oh, when we were growing up, <laughs> 
we were all teenagers together, right? And so we can only have, it's six of us, and we can only have one friend a piece over at a time. So if there's six of us, so we could have six friends. Everybody can have one friend. You got two friends, then you got the lead. Let, keep off your friends. If it's all three, y'all not gonna be in here. So she had rules and regulations. And when you get when you got into our house, you had to follow the rules and regulations. And some people kind of thought she ain't gonna do that. My mother carried a load of 38. Yes, she did. She said, y'all too big to whoop. And if I have to pop a cap in one of y'all, I'm going to have to pop all of y'all because they're going to they gonna come to get me. That For one of y'all, y'all going to go in a group. I tell them all the time, if you ever decide you want to kidnap my kids, make sure you kidnap all six of them because they come in a group. They, this is not a one size or two. Or, no, you got to take all six of them. So nobody kidnapped us, to say the least. And we were in there. Yabby, 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 yabby. She was like, I told y'all to be quiet. Yabby, 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 yabby. And we go, hurry, hurry, hurry. And then we go back up the fever pitch. She came down this there in her, they call them dusters back then. She came down in her dusters and her slippers with her pocketbook on her arm with her loaded 38 in it. I, I thought it was like, I don't know why she always carried her purse on her arm until that day. Uh. I don't care what it was. Ran a shine. She had that pocketbook because she carried a loaded 38 revolver. She said, I got, I think it was a six shooter or something like that because it was six of us. And she said, I got one with your name on it. Don't think I won't do it. I bought you here. I take you out. And see, a lot of people really didn't think, oh no, when they tell you that, when you become a parent, you have every right to tell your child, you're not going to do it, I'm sure. But you got to strike the fear in them. You got to have walking on eggshells. And sometimes I think my mother just did it just because she could do it, just to see how far we could go. And, and we would go. And they, my sisters and brothers knew I didn't like a mess. Ma'am, one of my younger sisters, we were like the neat freaks in the family. Our room state was immaculate, you know, the whole nine. And my mother, she, she, after our father passed away, she slept with her books and her periodicals and her magazines and, you know, and she didn't want anybody to come in. And she, she wasn't a nasty person by no means, but she was junky. And I could understand why you got six kids. First thing you want to do, she take her shoes off at the door. She pulling the girdle down, going up the steps. I tried that one time and I almost killed myself. I couldn't get it down, uh, get it down far. And it was down like the boys wear their pants all on the ankles and you can't run. And I tripped and I fell backwards over the steps. And she, she looked over the steps and she said, you know, that's a process, baby. That's a learned behavior. Like you're going to fall down the steps because you don't even know what you're doing. And, and, and. And she, she, so when I was telling you when she was talking to the lady, I got all off track. When she got talked, but that's what I do. You gotta keep up with the mother. Brain be moving at a mile a minute. Uh, when we got the lady and she did her thing, oh, I did tell you that. And she got the restraining order and he went berserk. My mother told him, oh, I did finish that. And so we were on to the next one. So that's why I was Sister Love in, in college. And people always ask me, where'd you get the name Mother Love? This, the, this was my favorite one about Mother Love. They said, is Mother Love your real name? And I didn't make it any better. I said, yeah, my mama saw this baby. She had so many kids. She said, I don't know what I'm going to name it. We just going to name this one Mother Love. No, that's my stage name. That's, that's, my, uh, that's my stage name. It's a trademark. It's a registered trademark. And yes, it belongs to me, this Mother Love. <laughs> so when I had our son, which I never even thought I would have kids, I mean, technically they weren't on the radar for me because I was just a kid. And all my girlfriends was having babies when they were like 16 and 17. I had to go get a whole nother group of friends to go hang out with that didn't have babies. And they were like, well, you could just have a baby and you know, you could be here with us. And I was like, oh, I don't think that's God's plan for me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do well in motherhood because I, I, my mother called me flippity gibbet. She said, your, man, your brain go too fast and you switch gears too quick. She she used to tell me, well, see, I got to worry about you getting pregnant. I said, why? Well, first of all, this is me. If you're pregnant, your mama know you having sex, right? I don't know why I'm whispering <laughs> sometimes when you say something like that. And I was like, she is never going to know when I'm having sex until I tell her I'm having sex. But they know. She knew. She she knew it. She knew it. And when she knew it, I was like, uh-uh, we ain't having nobody's baby. And let me tell you, mama. I'm going to tell you how your mama could tell. And your daddy could tell, too. 
if your dad is in the home. Because for the most part, I this is what I think. I think children can take on the uh, the essence, you know, as far as smell is concerned. And I smelled a lot like my mother, but I could also smell like my father when I put on Old Spice. And I was I like, I don't wear men's cologne if it smells good. If I, don't smell, I don't understand that part, but nonetheless. Uh, okay. I'm just keeping it real. So me and dude was that. And I understood why mothers tell their daughters Keep your panties on. And when they get on fire and your hormones are raging, that's why they used to tell us take a cold shower. I thought it was just meant for guys, but that was meant for everybody. Well, I didn't take a cold shower that time. And then I found out why she said, keep your panties on. Because when it's done right, you could be like, oh, no wonder she told me not to do this. No, don't do this like ever. Oh, my God. It was like, I'm a woman now. And she said, you're a woman when you got a different address than I do. And I went and got a different address than she had when I was 17. And I was like, she can't tell me nothing to do. She can't tell me what to do anymore. Your parents, I don't care if you're 712 and your parents are 748, they going to tell you, you my child and I can say what I want to to you. And I was like, when does that part go away? Never. It never goes away. When you're a parent, you're a parent for life. That's a life time position. Some of you all look at, look at it like a job and then you want to blame the kids when you the one made the decision to sleep with old dude or new dude or some dude or somebody else's husband or boyfriend or whatever. And then you get mad because you made a bad decision. I had a girlfriend and this was what was stupid for me. One, okay, I could see, you know, I, you know, you can understand that, you know, because, you know, it was free love. You know, and you can do what you want. And it wasn't a big thing about being married. You didn't have to marry your baby's daddy. Or, you know, boys back in the day, they used to, this was before my time. They would say, you got a girl in, in trouble. You got to marry her. And I'm like, what kind of trouble they, what kind of trouble did they get in? And I didn't want that kind of trouble. And when I found out what the deal was, I was like, oh. And some people get carried away. Some people just want to have everybody. You got you got your fence sitters, the, the bisexual people. And I'm just gonna y'all know how I feel about bisexuality. Pick a side. Why you got to be greedy to have everybody? I like like men, I like women, I like everybody, I just love everybody. Somebody's gonna get hurt in that. And I think that's extremely selfish. I have seen it happen. I have seen it break up marriages. And I, I think it's unfair. I think it's unfair to all three parties involved. That's just how I feel. You know, and cheating is cheating. I don't care if you're male or female. If that if that ain't your boo, and you fooling with that boo, you know you're wrong. So don't be sometimes, oh, well, see, mother love, you don't understand. Oh, baby, yes, I do. I understand. I was a teenager, not with one set, not with one pair of panties on fire, all panties on fire. I mean, I would take a, uh, you, you, the older, the more seasoned ladies will know that remember this, the panties we would get with the days of the week on them, like, I didn't understand that. Why you got to have two? Can I wear two of these panties on Saturday? It was just like, no, you wear Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I would mess up the whole week. And she was like, I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. Literally, I walked in the door and I walked past her. And she just, all she said was, you know, when your mama start doing it and your elders start doing it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When they get the morning, well, and she did that, and I wheeled myself right on up the stairs, and I came back down and figured maybe she ain't got nothing to say to me. She said, when I came in and sat down where she said, so, how did it feel? Excuse me, ma'am? How did what feel? She said, now, if you think I'm stupid enough to think your panties was on the floor somebody with somebody and somebody didn't wasn't running up in you, you think I'm crazy? And I was like, I can't, well, what am I going to say? Nah, mama, you crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. I'd have been slapped into the middle of two weeks later. And you do. I'm going to tell you how your mom and them know. Women and men, your gait changes. The way that you walk changes completely. And I, I, 
I didn't understand it. I didn't realize that. Uh, Ma still thinks she could tell me how to cook. I say yes, 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 and then hang up the phone when we're done and do it in my way in the kitchen. <laughs> I said, what? Eagle old school music singing. See, now you just placating. Cause see that that in itself could start a whole nother argument. You know, well, what you mean? I could cook. I then I never told him I could cook. Everybody said, "Don't let." Cause I had a short attention span. I do. I still do. I have the attention span of a seventeen-year-old, and I get that. I get that. Uh, and <laughs> she knew. She knew when my brothers did it the first time, cause they came in walking like, and I I understood it after I saw them. But how could she see that man? She goes, "Do you realize I'm a woman? I've given birth to six children. Do, you, you you do understand that? Six live births. I've had children, so I understand how you. You're, and I didn't know what a gate was. I thought it was like the eight eight. You open up the gate and walk in the gate, close the gate. No, your gate G A I T. The way that you walk. Uh, uh and so. And so one of the things that attracted me to my husband to this day, he got a sexy swagger when he walked. You know, he just, he, he the gait he has, you know, he walked like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Uh, Barack Obama, he, uh, now tell me you didn't see ultimate swagger in the 44th president dude headed down to a fine science. And that comes from a man being confident in who he is. You know, men don't beat up on women. Boys beat up on women. Boy, and see, and women don't. That's what they always talk. They, my mother used to tell us, don't be fooling with no old man. I'm like, but I like old men. They have jobs. Some of them have pensions and they like me. They like young girls, you know, and all you got to do is just, you know, go around, let them smear you a little bit, you know, you know, just be a little bit flirty. And it's, oh, yeah, I like, I like what you want. You want to have my paycheck? You know what? I like y'all. give y'all my paycheck. <laughs> my brothers came in and she knew. And I said, I'm not going to do that. My mother, well, she knew I did, but I wasn't coming in there pregnant. Not, mm -mm. That wasn't getting ready to happen because then she would really know. And you don't want your mother to know stuff. And 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 I think that especially young mothers, you shouldn't share everything with your children. They don't want to know about, they don't need to know about your sex life. They don't need to know how many boyfriends you had before they daddy. They don't need to know how many chicks you hated. They don't need to know any of that skullduggery you were doing when you were a teenager. You know, and you know, chicks, women. Nasty women hurt women, what they say. Uh, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Hey, slicing up their tires, cutting up their clothes. I'm like, that take too much work. Why would you even do that? I don't understand that. I, and I did, when I went to Africa, this is one thing I didn't understand before I went and I understood completely when I came back to America. I used to couldn't understand why. Uh, the young fellas would be under the street lamp and they were, you know, when we had street lamps, yeah, we did, they would be under the street lamp and they'd be harmonizing and singing and, you know, and that was cool. And, and I didn't know where that came from, but it, I, I found out later. And, and, and the women, you know, uh, in our neighborhood, probably in a bunch of neighborhoods, they would have, uh, they had a TV show on it uh, about it called Sister Wives. And they would go, uh, that's my wife-in-law. In our neighborhood, oh, that's my wife. How is she your wife in law? Well, she she and I, we share uh, our man. She got kids with him, and I got kids with him. And one of my girlfriends was like that. And she had three kids with this guy. And one day, I came over there. To, she asked me to bring her something. I can't even remember what it was. But she asked me to come over and I to bring her whatever it was. And I come upstairs, and it's like a room. It, it's her. It's three other women in there. And they got all these little kids running around. I'm like, it was like, I don't know, maybe seven or eight kids. And they all looked alike, right? Come to find out, these are all her baby daddy's kids. And I said, and I took her in the back. I said, girl, what are you doing? Why you want these chicks up in here? She said, well, um, this one got evicted. And um, we he, he just didn't have the money to pay her rent. And so I, 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 he said she could stay up here with her, with us until she got herself together. I'm like, I'm all for that, but you ain't standing up in my house and you got a baby with him. I, I don't, but that's what they did. And when I came back from Africa, that was a normal thing. 
the chief could have as many wives as he wanted to, to have as many kids as he wanted to. And he would go, the chief that we spent time with, he had he had Sunday off. I don't even know how they could tell what day or the week it was. And he had like four or five wives. And he spent one day a week with each one. And then he had a day by himself. And then he had a day that he spent with all his kids. And he must have had about 11, 10 kids. I don't know. It was a lot. And that's where we our our, our natural our natural uh, instinct is to mother. I, I don't care who it is, and especially when they're babies and they're children. I mean, and you think about this. We women, us mothers, this is our spastic that we could get, but we're not going to let a child suffer because of something stupid their parents did. We will take care of our ex-husband's new white baby because she don't have a babysitter and he wouldn't trust anybody that he didn't know with his child except me. And what you do, oh, bring the baby on over here. It's all right. You take care of the baby. And then the mama get mad because the baby closer to you than they are to them. That, that was your mess. This child don't have anything to do with the, the horrible decisions that you made. So now you got to clean that crap show up. And then you want to blame it. You look just like your daddy. My mother used to say that to me when I was growing up. Now I look just like her. I kid you not. You ever want to know what my mother looked like? This is it. I even got my mother's hair. And, okay, yeah, I bought it because it looks like her. And she would say, old men don't need to be with young girls because an old man will give a young girl worms. Well, that kind of turned me off after she said that. And and my my thing was, but I like older, I like, I didn't say I like older men. I said I like old men. I mean, I was like, what, 18, 19 years old? No, I wasn't, I wasn't even quite that old. My first old uh friend was right before I went to college. And I said, no, oh well, y'all know, y'all know where the bodies are buried. Y'all could just oh uh, uh I remember when she when that guy got he let her, you know, custom design him a Lincoln Continental and he let me design the car. He had a custom, I didn't even know you could do that. Custom made. Uh I don't even remember what year it was. And it was it was a, a butterscotch color had they said buttery every, and I found this out when you're doing this with cars. Uh, and it's like in a restaurant. The more ingredients they add to the menu of a dish on a restaurant, the more it's going to cost you. The more you customize a car, the more it's going to cost you. Well, I wanted to have, you know, gangster wheels, and I wanted the wheel on the back where the, where the, where the a spare went, and it was like a, a pretty hubcap and all of that. And, and it was a beautiful vehicle. Oh, and this was the piece de resistance. He let me drive it. No driver's license, no driving lessons. But I did have driving lessons because I got them from one of my, uh, 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 the chick we trained, we uh, trained to be camp counselors and she had a stick shift and she said, I'll teach you how to drive. And so I said, okay, we can go down to the lake and learn in the parking lot. She said, well, that'd be stupid. You're going to be just driving around in the parking lot. No, I'm a, you can go out on the street and learn how to drive because that's where the traffic is. So my thing was don't. And she said, you better not hit nothing. And she got it. And it was a stick shift. And it really bowled me well later on in life when I became a school bus driver because they didn't have to teach me how to drive a stick shift. What they did have to teach me was how to get the bus off a hill. They take you on the school bus, get you on the incline like this, and then stop up here at the top. And now you got to get, and the bus cannot roll back three inches. That's, what is that? That's about three inches. A school bus. I was the past master. These are hands of glory. And Oh, and I learned how to drive a bus. And then eventually the, I learned, I was uh, recruited as a trainer to train other people to drive the bus, and I, specifically a stick shift. And I was like, okay, I can do this. And that, that was how it happened. And when people, when people were, what was I trying to tell you about the bus and, and, people, and the community of, of the people in Africa? The women were all there together. They all washed the clothes together. They cooked together. They sold their wares together. Uh, you know, and when you read in the scripture, I can't tell you which one it is, but the scripture says uh, a, a holy woman sits at the gates and sells her wares to make sure her family is fine. She sells the best food, the best food, the best fabric, everything. So, and that's what it is. So you got to pay attention to folk and learn from people. Learn something every day. You know, well, I, this my girl, Joelle, she's, mm, hey, girlfriend, a mother, a mother, no. You know your mama knew when you were doing things with the fellas. 
And I know why. Uh, uh, Igru says she learned the hard way. Older men and younger women do not belong together because they are from two different universes. Ten years up or ten years down. Well, I like them like 30 years older than me. I want them to have some, you know, some ruggedness to them. And, and then when they, you know, when they want to ask for stuff, I say, you know, I will. But that's going to cost you extra. I love it. Thank you guys for playing along and enjoying Mother Love. This is how you can get you can get in touch with Mother Love. You can come, uh, I'm on Facebook at the Mother Love Show. I'm on X at Mother Love Show. I'm on uh, uh, YouTube at Mother Love Show. I'm on TikTok at the Mother Love Show. And uh, indeed at the Mother Love Show and Instagram at Mother Love Show. Know that I love you and remember this. No matter how big or tall, short or small, thick or thin, matters not what skin you're in. Everybody needs some other love now and then. Peace, babies. Yeah,